y'all, Dixie here. Today I wanna to answer some silly questions about backpacking. This is actually the fourth silly questions video I've made and I don't actually think the questions are silly, but it all started back a couple of years ago when I made a post on the Homemade Wanderlust Backpacking Forum group on Facebook inviting people to ask any questions they've been a little bit intimidated to ask about backpacking in a no judgment zone where myself or other people in the community because we've got over 60k members now could help answer the questions and so i've been doing that ever so often since and today is a continuation of that if you want to check out any videos in the past the link to those videos will be in the description of this video the first question is about bear bagging and this particular hiker asks hey i know i am supposed to hang all of my toiletries in my food bag when i'm hanging a bear bag at night like toothpaste bug spray sunscreen etc but what about when i use those things during the day on my body am i supposed to wash that off before i climb in my tent at night you could but if you think about it you're coming from civilization into the woods probably really good smelling anyway you've got fresh laundry detergent on your hiker clothes shampoo in your hair soap on your body you might even put a little swipe of deodorant before you get started now you could go through the trouble of using all unscented products before you hit the trail and then washing before you get in your tent at night with unscented soap but even still you've probably hopefully brushed your teeth before you went to sleep at night so you've got the scent of toothpaste in your mouth or if you don't brush your teeth then the smell of the food that you ate. So I really feel like that's just overkill, but if that's what helps somebody literally sleep at night, then they should go for it and do whatever makes them comfortable. Just make sure if you're using soap that you're at least 200 feet from water sources. Uh, but again, I don't really think it's necessary. You just wanna make sure that you get the main source of those items out of your tent at night when you sleep, because they're gonna be a lot more concentrated than the little bit you've got on you. Next, I wanna talk about bidets on trail. Now, this is coming from a place of doing research. I don't have any personal experience with this yet. After looking into it, it might be something I'll test out going forward just because I'm always looking for ways to mix things up anyway. Currently, I'm a TPer who comes behind and cleans up with a baby wipe just to feel, you know, a little bit cleaner. But according to bidayers, us TPers are gross because basically we're just smearing our doo-doo all on our booties and pulling up our pants and calling it clean and they're not really wrong so apparently a bidet is as close as you can get to feeling shower fresh at least you know on your booty so the main arguments i've seen for using a bidet are one you don't have to carry the weight of toilet paper you don't have to deal with packing it out creating more waste etc two Again, you get a lot more clean than you would with toilet paper. And I could see this being a great idea for folks who are plagued with butt crack chafe to try because I feel like helping that area get really clean could help prevent the chafing. Now, some people are true warriors and they squirt with the bidet. And then once they feel like most of the stuff is squirted off, they'll rub with their hand and then they're done. And then they wash their hands with something like Dr. Bronner's and of course, Again, if you're gonna use soap on trail, make sure that you're 200 feet from a water source, which if you're going number two, you should be 200 feet from a water source anyway. Some folks are like, heck no, I'm not touching my butt with my hand. And they'll still tote toilet paper, but they just tote, you know, a fraction of the amount that they normally would because they just do a little, a little dabble do you type thing and make sure that it's actually clean and dry back there. And then some people even take like a reusable small towel type thing and wash it when they get home and use it again on the next backpacking trip. One of the big questions that I saw about bidets though is should you use filtered water? And I would say, I don't know that it really matters as far as getting sick, something like Giardia, because if you go swimming in rivers and lakes and bodies of water that haven't been treated your butthole is probably touching water that has giardia or something that you wouldn't want to ingest through your mouth so the idea of filtered water is you know you're you're drinking that stuff and, and putting it down into your guts um but but 
it's probably a good idea to use the filtered water through your bidet anyway because you don't want to clog it up with sediment especially if that's the only thing you have to you know do the job while you're out there there were two main bidets that i saw people buzzing about in the comments and that is the culo clean i don't know if i'm pronouncing that correctly but c-u-l-o clean and it's just a little attachment that you can put into pretty much any water bottle you would have and then there was the Butler, B-U-T-T-L-E-R. And that is its own separate bottle that has an extending spout. So some people might find that a little bit more convenient, especially if they're afraid of mixing it up with their regular water bottles. But I think if you use the bidet properly, then that doesn't matter anyway. But anyway, if this is something that I move forward with in the future, I will let y'all know how it goes. The next question is, how do I know if my tent needs to be seam sealed? And this could be true for other things like a tarp, etc. But your shelter does need to be seam sealed in some way because if you think about it, even if it's a waterproof fabric and you punch holes through it to stitch it together, you've created holes where water can come through. So most companies that are selling a shelter that has been seam sealed, they wanna brag on that because it's not something that you have to do yourself. So you should see that in the description, you know, already seam sealed. Um, but it is something that I would check with the manufacturer before I purchased a shelter. But if you're sitting at home with a tent already and you're like, okay, well, that doesn't help me now. I need to know, you should be able to get on the website and figure that out. But the bottom line is if you pull the shelter out and you look at where it is stitched together, some might be seam sealed on the outside, some on the inside, um, but you should see either a tape type seam sealing. So it'll look like, you know, it's stitched together and then they put tape over it, or it'll be a liquid that has now dried and you can see that on the stitching and it might look like it's kind of a hardened gel now, like hot glue or something like that. But if you don't see anything but material and stitches going through it then it needs to be seam sealed and this is something to even look at on your rain gear because some rain gear comes not seam sealed some companies will offer a seam sealing service extra on top of the price of the product and then you know some won't offer that at all they'll just already do it and some won't do it at all uh, but you can get the stuff to seam seal yourself but you want to make sure that you're getting the right product for the fabric that your shelter is made of. So that's something that, again, you can check with the manufacturer to find out what they recommend for seam sealing or find out what that material is and then look up the exact product for that type of material. What about going to the bathroom at night? If you're either scared to get out of the tent at night or you just really hate getting up or if it's really cold out there and you don't want to, this particular lady that asked the question says that one of her friends uses a Ziploc bag in her tent to go to the bathroom in and then she seals it up and goes back to sleep. Uh, but she says, I'm a little nervous to do that. I feel like it would spill or I'd make a mess. And me too, girl, me too. The first thing I thought of when I read this question is my friend Perk because he hates getting up in the middle of the night to have to go pee. So he just uses a Gatorade bottle and I feel like that would work well for most guys and probably a lot of y'all guys have done that before just don't confuse the two bottles that you collect your water in and urinate in but anyway uh for us ladies you know it could be a little more difficult to ring a hole like that so they do make urination devices i don't know exactly what they're called but they allow women to stand up and go to the bathroom like the shiwi or the pea style or you know other creative names i've never used one of those personally but i've heard great things about them um, there are a lot of ladies who love using those because they don't have to pull their whole bottoms out of their britches while they're going to the bathroom on the trail during the day so i think in this instance it could come in handy again i've never personally tried it but i feel like if you can stand up to use it then you can probably get up on your knees in your tent and use it the same way go into a Gatorade bottle and then you know deal with it the next morning I have read that it's good to not just throw yourself out there on trail with this and, and try to rely on success the first time so a lot of ladies recommend trying it in the shower first and then practicing going into a toilet while standing up and you could even practice you know in your bathroom kneel down like you would be in your tent and see if you have success with that so what about hacking with dentures 
This particular hiker says that at night, they typically take their dentures, put it into a cup when they're at the house, put a tablet in there and let them soak all night. On trail, they've been using a camp cup, but they just didn't know if there might be a better option out there. I've never had the full set of dentures, but I used to have a flipper with one fake tooth on it. And that's why I actually have the braces and all of that going on so I can make room for an implant and be done with that thing. Um, but what I would do is just brush it really well and rinse it off when I've brushed the rest of my teeth and then put it in a hard container case. But if you're really set on soaking it every night, if that's just something that you feel like you definitely need to do, uh, then maybe you could get something like a small Tupperware container that has a, a twist on lid. So if it does get knocked over in the middle of the night while you're sleeping, you don't have to worry about it leaking out everywhere. And that's something, you know, I would try out at home, turn it on its side and make sure and then if you are in bear country and you're worried about the scent of that tablet, you could get one of those OP sacks, odor proof sacks, seal it up and then keep it in the tent with you. Or if it's in one of those things, like I was saying that um, doesn't spill, then you could put it in your bear bag with all of your other stuff. I would be a little nervous about putting it in the bear bag just in case a very skilled bear got it and then ran off with it because that is something expensive. I know for just my one tooth on the flipper, it was like 300 bucks every time I had to replace it. But anyway, that odor proof sack should help you out and also act as a redundancy in making sure that if your Tupperware thing was to leak, it would be in a closed up bag. The next question is what are the rules or what is the etiquette when you're in the situation of a steep slope and you've got a hiker ascending and one descending. Who has the right of way there? The rule of thumb is that the uphiller has the right of way and the downhiller is supposed to find a safe spot, ease over to the side and let the uphiller squeeze by. And the reason for this is when you're going up a climb, a lot of people say that they get this momentum about them and that if they stop, they lose all of that wind in their sails. But for me personally, anytime I see a hiker coming downhill and I'm struggling and out of breath on the uphill, I'm happy to move over and let them come on through. So a lot of times that happens, you'll have both parties kind of step off. No, really you go, no, really you go. But uh, technically the uphiller does have the right of way. So it's best if you, you know, at least offer them to come by first and, and if they need a break, they'll move over and let you go. And if they don't want to lose that momentum, then they'll just go on full speed ahead. The next question is, do you ever come to a point where you just accept that you're a dirty, stinky hiker and you have to deal with it? And I think the answer is that depends on everybody. There may be some people who still aren't over it and they obsess with it while they're out on trail, but I think it depends on, you know, what type of hiking you're doing. If you're going out for shorter trips, and you're doing shorter days during the day and spending more time in camp in the evenings or in the morning, you might like to take extra care and be more clean than the through hiker who's gonna be out there on a six month trip and is trying to do more miles during the day and is probably too exhausted to worry with too much when they get to camp. And also, I mean, there are some people who just don't have an issue with being the dirty, stinky hiker and, and some who, might not really ever get over that. But for myself, I've found the more years that I go backpacking and certainly the length of my trip makes a difference and how much I obsess over being clean. But I think the main thing that's important is each individual person is covering their bases at least to the bare minimum so they're not causing themselves issues out on the trail. You don't wanna end up with really bad chafing in your nether regions or some other swampy stuff going on down there and also foot care. Having trench foot or other types of foot funk is no fun out on the trail. So making sure that you've got at least a couple pairs of underwear and a couple pairs of socks where you can rotate those out while you're on trail. Um, maybe rinse a pair out after wearing it a day or two, let it air dry, put the other pair on, and then you know do the same thing after a couple of days. And that again is going to depend on the individual and what their body needs but as long as you're covering those bases then i feel like everything else is bonus if you want more information about hygiene on the trail i've got 
at least two videos on the channel about that topic. And there are some other videos where I mention different things about hygiene. So I'll put some of those in the description of this video. The next question is, do people, and this person asked specifically, do I shave on trail? And I will say this, I think that shaving is a personal thing for men and women. If they want to shave on trail, great. If they don't want to shave on trail, great. Not shaving and having hair on your body is a natural thing because it grows there. But also if you find yourself wanting to shave while you're out on trail, I don't think there's anything wrong with that either. I've seen people online, especially women, shame one another for a woman wanting to shave while she's out on trail. And to me, it's your body and whatever makes you comfortable and happy, that's what you should do. So for me personally, when I started my through hike of the Appalachian Trail, I did carry a razor with me and I would shave my armpits sometimes in my tent in the morning uh, before I would go hiking. Now I'm one of those weird people that can dry shave and it doesn't bother me, but I know that there are people who cannot do that. So you could always carry something like Dr. Bronner soap with you and lather up and do that out on trail if you wanted to, or maybe even some lotion would work. But you definitely don't want to be getting in the water sources directly and lathering up and shaving there. So make sure you're 200 feet from the water sources. After a couple of weeks, I decided I didn't want to fool with that out on trail. So I would shave when I got into town for my resupply. Sometimes I'd carry a razor with me. Sometimes I just purchase a disposable one in the town somewhere and use it until you know, it's time to get a new one. And that's pretty much what I still do. If I'm on a smaller hike, a week or less, I just don't worry about it. I don't carry one with me. And if I'm on a hike long enough that I'll have to resupply, then again, I either take one with me or get it while I'm in town. Both things are possible. Both things are okay. It really depends on the personal preference of the hiker. The next question is who is entitled to use shelters on a hiking trail? Is it the section hikers or the through hikers? And the answer is both. Most of the hiking trails I've been on that have shelters, it's like a first come first serve thing. So it doesn't matter if you're just there for a couple of nights or if you're doing the whole trail, it's whoever walks up there first gets to use the shelter. Now, the only area where I've seen that it's different than that is in the Smoky Mountain National Park on the Appalachian Trail. And I assume that that's what this question was aimed at. There they have an interesting system that I feel like causes a little bit of animosity between the section hikers and the through hikers, but it's neither of the hikers fault. It's just the way that the rules are. So what the Smoky Mountain National Park does is requires section hikers to reserve a shelter each night that they're going through the park. You don't get to camp in a tent or a hammock. I mean, you can break the rules, you know, and a park ranger can come through and fine you for it. Um, but that's the way that it's set up. They're supposed to reserve the shelters. And I assume that once the shelters are completely booked, then they don't, you know, allow a section hiker to make a booking for that shelter. Now through hikers get a special permit to go through the Smoky Mountain National Park. So they don't have to declare where they're going to sleep ahead of time. Uh, but it does make things a little weird when you get out on the trail because they require you to sleep in a shelter, whether you're a section hiker or through hiker, all hikers must sleep in a shelter unless the shelter is full. So if you come up to a shelter as a through hiker and it's full, then you are permitted to set up your tent or your hammock, but you still have to do it there at the shelter. And I assume they're just trying to minimize traffic and impact on the trail so they don't have people camping at all these different areas. Um, so everyone has to stay there at least near the shelter. But if you walk up to the shelter and it's not full and you're a through hiker, you must sleep in the shelter. So the problem comes in and the animosity I was talking about when the shelter is full, everybody's all nestled in there together and a section hiker rolls up and says, Hey, I have a reservation for a spot in the shelter tonight. So the last through hiker that came to the shelter now has to pack up all their stuff and go out and set up their tent, hammock, tarp, etc. So while it might not sound like it's fair, it's the way that the rules are set up. And I have seen this happen on trail where even in the cold rain, a through hiker had to pack up and leave because of the section hiker. And I promise you the section hiker probably felt bad, but I assume they probably didn't even have a tent, hammock, whatever with them. 
uh, because they are relying on these places that they reserved by orders of the Smoky Mountain National Park. So national parks can be a little iffy, but the shelter structures themselves, other than that area, where I've been backpacking, it's first come, first serve. The next question is, how do you check for ticks in places that the sun don't shine? On the places that you can't see on yourself, you can ask other hikers to take a look for you. Now, of course, I understand there might be some areas that you don't want just everybody looking at, but I mean, on your back or in your waistband of your pants, you know, areas like that where somebody can take a quick look and can see better than you, then that's always nice. Now, if you just don't want anybody looking at you at all or feel weird asking somebody, I promise if you ask them, they'll probably be happy because then they'll ask you to return the favor. But if that just makes you uncomfortable, then it helps to have a mirror. I always carry a mirror brush combo with me so you can check by you know, looking at those areas, holding your mirror behind you and you know, looking in the mirror. Also, just feeling. If you slowly rub your hand across your skin, then you should be able to feel at least any ticks of any decent size. But those little bitty bitty guys can possibly be on your skin and you not feel them. So I do think it's good to have a mirror. Also, if you do feel one, it helps to have the mirror for removing it. But this is a lot easier in the daylight. If you're trying to do this in your tent with a headlamp, it can make it a little bit trickier. Uh, but I've still managed to get it done because I do typically not hike. And so when I get in my tent at night and I'm checking for ticks, it's usually dark. But I tend to check for ticks twice if I've been seeing them a pretty good bit. Once when I go to sleep at night and the other when I wake up in the morning. And I know you're thinking, well, if you've been in your tent the whole night, why would you check for ticks again? Uh, but sometimes they can hang out on your pack or other gear that has brush trees during the day and find their way to you for a midnight snack while you're sleeping at night. But trying to catch them within 24 hours is important because if you catch them in that first 24 hour period, it really minimizes your chance for getting a tick-borne illness. After a day of hiking in the rain and you get to a shelter and it's still raining outside and there are other folks in the shelter, you get in there, start setting up, how do you change out of your wet clothing to the dry clothes that you want to sleep in that night without everybody seeing you? Some of the roofs on shelters create kind of a little overhang. So you could announce to the shelter, and, and I'm telling you, if you've got shyness about this, it, it will go away because you would rather announce it than somebody accidentally see you, or at least I would. So I would just announce to the shelter, hey, I'm gonna go to the side of the shelter right over here and change my clothes. So unless you wanna see you know, a full moon, then don't step to the side of the shelter right now. Um, but if you're in a situation where you're gonna get rained on, you know, regardless of where you are outside of the shelter, then you can ask somebody, if you've met a hiking friend along the way or you got a hiking buddy already with you, to hold up a sleeping bag in the corner of the shelter so that you can change. My friend Riga and I did that for one another on the AT. So it's like, hey everybody, I'm fixing a change in the corner here. So if everybody could just look that way and then hopefully your friend will hold up the sleeping bag and turn their head and let you do your business there behind your quilt or sleeping bag. Also, you can set up your sleeping pad and sit on top of that and just kind of drape your quilt or sleeping bag over the top of you and, and change under it while you're sitting under there. And I mean, most people will have the decency to know that you're, you know, trying to change. Um, I've, I've laid flat on mine before and, and draped mine over me and pulled my britches down and done all of what I needed to do. Of course, with that method, you want to make sure that you're not getting what's going to keep you warm that night, your quilt or sleeping bag soaked from your wet clothes. So you got to be kind of careful. Also, you can do this in the corner of your shelter by yourself if you don't have a partner. Just again, announce to everybody, hey, I'm going to change, nobody look. And make sure you say it first, because as soon as you say, hey, don't look, everybody's going to look. And then they're like, oh yeah, she said don't look, and then they'll turn. Uh, but anyway, so you can go to the corner, turn your back to everybody. If you're a lady and you don't want to show your lady bits to the world, uh, take your shirt off and sports bra. Again, you got your back to everybody. So at most they'll see a naked back. Put on your dry top and then turn back around and face everybody. And you can take your quilt or sleeping bag and just kind of tuck it under your armpit so it's hanging down in front of you. And then pull your britches off, shimmy them off, and then put the dry ones on 
and voila, you now are warm and dry. So there are several different ways that you can get a little bit of privacy to change your clothes while you're in a shelter with other people. The bottom line is everybody is in the same boat as you are. And if you're not the first one to suggest, hey, this corner over here is the changing corner, everybody look that way so everybody can get, can get changed, somebody else probably will. Well, all right, y'all, those are all of the silly questions I have for y'all today. If any of y'all have other suggestions or answers for these questions, please feel free to share that in the comments below. I am just one person with limited experience, so I'm always happy for others to weigh in. Or if you have questions that were not answered in this video or the other videos that I've done about random questions, then feel free to leave that in the comments too and we'll see if myself or somebody else in the community can't help you out. And again, judgment-free zone, so y'all be sweet to folks commenting. It can be intimidating to throw these questions out there and you know, I always felt like when I was learning to backpack that people would be like, well, if you don't know these answers, then why are you going backpacking? And, and it just shouldn't be like that. It's okay to ask questions and it's okay to learn from people who have different experiences than you. Thank y'all so much for watching. Don't forget to subscribe before you go and we will see y'all next time.